lines. So I will talk about uh, the genomic region analysis and genome editing for rice gain quality improvement. As the time is very short, so I will try to be very quick so I can cover all the things which I have put up in this presentation. So So these are the contents which I would like to uh, discuss with all of you that uh, first we will discuss about the rice gain production, consumption and quality and all this sort of stuff we will discuss. And uh, uh, as you all know that uh, the rice provide around 21 to 23% of the caloric need around the globe and it, uh, it is also considered that rice is the uh, provide the calories to the 50, more than 50% of the world population. And only in the Southeast Asia, it provides 76% of the caloric needs of the uh, population. And it is expected that uh, the, the demand will increase about 40% by 2030 from the current production which we have. So they, uh, therefore, the grain quality is also imperative because the consumer preference and farmer profits and the multiple use of the food products both at home and industry are equally important. So therefore, it is very important to increase the grain quality. So quality, uh, the consideration has been became more valuable owing to three most important reasons. Number one is the increase in income, elevation in the living standard and awareness on malnutrition. So here in this slide, you can see that uh, uh, the, the top 10 rice uh, uh, producing uh, uh, countries and also the consuming countries. And uh, uh, it has been shown that China remained the highest rice consuming country uh, in the year 2020. And in Pakistan, if, we, if I will allow me to discuss in Pakistan, we, we mostly, uh, our staple crop is wheat and we mostly produce the rice and it is mostly uh, exported to the other countries and it brings the revenue for the country. So in this slide, you can see there are two uh, indents. One is in the yellow in, and one in red. Both are showing the import and export and different countries have the different potential about the import and export of the rice. And it is also creating the income and also it is providing the caloric requirement of the population. So if we specifically have talk about the grain quality, the grain quality is divided into four components. Number one is the milling, then the appearance quality, the cooking and eating quality and nutritional quality. While I was in my PhD, so my basic focus remain with the cooking and eating quality and also with the nutritional quality improvement of the rice. So we tried to, uh, first we tried to analyze the, uh, and identify the cooking and eating quality uh, QTLs uh, also called the genomic region, uh, genomic regions, which are controlling the important uh, genetic architecture of these states. And from nutritional aspect, it was uh, in my domain, the protein remained the most important consideration. As you know that uh, United Nations have different uh, sustainable development goals and zero hunger remain the second a sustainable goal and as a plant building it remain our prime responsibility to increase the yield as well as to increase the nutritional quality of the staple crops uh, most importantly cereals not only in the rice but also in the wheat and maize and other uh, cereals also remain that yield and quality gone up uh, but uh, we have succeeded uh, not so well and there is a need to exploit the novel plant breeding techniques which can help us to develop the germ plant which have better ability to cope with all these sort of things in which we are lacking behind. So malnutrition remain the uh, uh, basic problem uh, when, the, when the person diet uh, is not good enough and uh, is lacking from the basic components are some nutrients and minerals. And due to that, there, there, are, there can be three important uh, effects on the body. Number one, maybe the stunting growth, then the wasting, and then the obesity. So these are the three important um, the effects on the body of the human being, which can be due to the malnutrition. So based on this one, uh, we can assume, or we can, we can calibrate that there is a great need to develop such type of germ plant, which 
which can better provide the nutrition quality. So the food and nutrition security uh, can be achieved through the different uh, means. And number one and the most important for me is the careful use of the non-renewable energy resources or non-renewable resources like the land and water, then the sustainable agriculture practices who must have to be utilized these one, we have to be careful about the soil, land, water, and all these sort of things. Then uh, the government must give the incentive to the farmer so they can buy the good quality seed and they can produce more and they can they have the incentive to produce uh, the high quality products. Then the resource allocation, then the research and innovation. In research and innovation, there is a great need that uh, we move toward the precision breeding through with the help of the omics and the genome editing technologies. Then the, at the farmer end, there is a need to develop the technology adaptation. Then the government policies may need to be undertaken as well. So if we talk about the genetics of the rice gain quality, the genetics of the rice gain quality, you can see that with the four different components of the uh, rice grain that uh, there are different genes and QTLs which have been identified in the different backgrounds of the Indica, Japonica, because you know that uh, rice is divided, uh, rice or as a sativa have further divided into two types. Uh, one is the Indica that is a long grain and non-sticky and other one is the Japonica which is a sticky and short grain. So in the different backgrounds, uh, the Uh, different uh, uh, grain quality related traits. So based on uh, the previous finding, uh, we developed the study which can analyze that uh, the genomic regions which can control the cooking and eating quality traits and then the then the genomic region which can which can control the crude protein and the fraction of protein because the crude protein or total protein are further divided into four different components that are the glutamine, albumin, prolamine, and globulin. So cooking and eating quality uh, is determined. Uh, the most important components in cooking and eating quality are the amylose content, gel consistency, and gelatinization temperature. So uh, amylose content more than 25% make the cooked rice hard, dry, separate, and less tender. So it is preferred that the, we must have the varieties which have around the 20 to 25% of the amylose contents. And it further depends on the consumer countries, like the con what are the consumer preferences. Some consumer, like in China, they mostly like to have uh, rice, which is sticky in nature. Uh, if we talk about the India and Pakistan, so they mostly prefer about the non-sticky rice. So the amylose content, they vary among the varieties. And based on the consumer preferences, the researcher develop those type of varieties. So gel consistency is also important for the cooking and eating quality because if the gel, if if uh, the amylose content are high, so it 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 can be assumed that gel consistency may have um, uh, like the value of more than seventy. So more than seventy make the rice more hard. Then the gelatinization temperature and protein contents they both are also important and protein content actually also control the. A taste of the cooked rice. So there are several QTLs or gene which have been identified previously. Mm -hmm. And in this study, we also try to develop some uh, uh, QTLs which can, which can be further useful for the future breeding programs. So uh, the most important uh, gene which remained with our consideration was the Vexi gene. And uh, Vexi gene actually uh, that is uh, on the chromosome six. So in this study, we also in this study, we also identified that, that the VEXI gene was present on the chromosome 6, and we further analyzed that what is different in, in case of the varieties, in case of the lines of the population which we are using in our study. Then uh, in the same uh, genetic, in the same uh, plant population, we also uh, conduct the, another study which was dated to the seed storage protein, and the seed storage protein is actually the key determining factor uh, for the nutritional quality. So the, as I have told you earlier that the seed storage protein have uh, four components like the albumin, globulin, prolamine, and the glutalin. So based on the solubility, uh, these are fractioned into different types. So uh, here in this slide, you can see that uh, glutalin is, al uh, is actually the alkali soluble uh, protein. Then the globulin that is synthesized in the endo, uh, endoplasmic reticulum and is, uh, the weight is about the 57 kd and then the prolamine that is alcohol soluble, then the water soluble albumin and the globulin that is salt, salt soluble. Actually what we've done, 
in in this experiment we use these different uh, regions like uh, for the albumin we use the water as a region to extract the albumin protein then uh, the, for the globulin we prepare the region which have the salt so we extract by using the salt so these are the different uh, material and method which we use to extract these proteins and which were further uh, analyzed through the physiochemical uh, analysis so uh, uh, so far, uh, there there has been much work has been taken to understand the rice grain quality, but uh, obviously there is there is a requirement that um, the more in depth and uh, knowledge must be available uh, to the breeders and to the uh, researchers so that they can develop the high grain quality uh, rice that can be beneficial to the consumers as well. So in this study, we actually identify the QTL which were associated with the uh, cooking and eating quality. Then we detect the allelic variation in the vexy gene. Actually, whenever we uh, study the eating and cooking quality, we always consider the vexy gene as well because the vexy gene is the major gene which control the cooking and eating quality. And as well, it has the influence on the protein contents uh, uh, of the rice varieties. So. The, this is actually the uh, breeding uh, method uh, and the breeding, breeding scheme which we use to develop the population. And there was around 193 uh, recombinant inbred lines which we developed and under the different environmental condition in, in uh, 2015 and 16, then 2017 and 18, we actually harvested the material and that material we used to identify the different uh, cooking and eating quality uh, related traits as well. Uh, sorry for the distortion. Uh, so th uh, this was the. Uh... <laughs> So uh, we, uh, you can hear me, please. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, still, the problem is same. I am sorry for that. The things are not in control. So I, I have turned off the video because there was some problem. So uh, we actually we uh, taken the phenotypic data and and when we uh, under the three different locations when we collected the phenotypic data we find out for the amylose content and the gel gelatinization temperature there was a bimodal uh, frequency distribution that on the basis of the bimodal frequency distribution we guess that maybe there is a, some influence of the major gene along with the manner gene which is controlling these states then. We all in the uh, subsequent years in 2017 and 18, under the two different environmental conditions, under the three different environmental conditions, we uh, collected the phenotypic data for the protein and the fractional protein. Actually, the crude protein was the main consideration, and then the glutalin content, which is about the 60 to 80 percent of the protein content total protein content that was the consideration then the global in albumin and the prolamin these are actually called the minor proteins and also they make the lesser portion 60 to 80 percent is by the glutalin protein and the rest of the portion has been by the global in albumin and the prolamin so on the on the in the in the in the phenotypic data we find out that there was a continuous distribution of uh, uh, the data so it indicates that uh, maybe uh, these are actually controlled by the they are polygenic in nature or these are the quantitative traits so maybe one gene is not responsible for controlling these traits or maybe there are more than one gene which are controlling uh, protein and the fraction of protein so we identify different qtls and uh, these qtls you can see that um, on the different chromosomes and uh, most of the qtls in both of the studies we find out they are locating on the chromosome number six so a tot in, in case of the cooking and eating quality, we identify the 33 QTLs and the, these QTLs were present on the all chromosome except for the chromosome 10 and 12. And there was the phenotypic variation range between 1.5.
spectral variation as well, and we also check the epistatic QTL, uh, which may have the influence on the major QTL controlling these states. In the another study in the uh, seed storage protein, we figure out that there are the 44 QTL which are controlling uh, these these five traits, and the uh, the phenotypic variation vary between the 3.70 to 12.47 percent. Similarly, we also uh, conducted another analysis to understand the epistatic QTL and the environmental influence of the uh, environmental influence on the expression of these QTLs. So, based based on these findings, we uh, we, we tried to find out that uh, the most of the QTL they are actually uh, they they are on the chromosome six and also the one of the major gene which control the uh, grain quality traits that is also on the uh, chromosome six that is called the vexigen. So we guess maybe there is some sort of allelic variation uh, uh, present between the lines and the parents of this population. So what we done that we collected uh, the leaves and we extracted the DNA and after DNA um, we designed some primers and we sequence uh, fully sequence the vexigen in the both parents and some lines which we selected on the basis of the phenotypic data. So uh, we, uh, when we're done with the Sanger sequencing, we find out that uh, there was, and also in the, uh, in the different exonic region of uh, the vexigene. The most important one was SNP1 and SNP2, which was present uh, in, in the exonic part of that, that, uh, uh, that gene vexigene. So we, uh, we guess maybe, the variation within these exonic region is responsible for the uh, phenotypic variation of the uh, phenotypic data which we uh, got for these traits. So to further unearth this thing, one of my lab mates at that time, we conducted another experiment. We knock out uh, the vexigene gene from both uh, uh, parents of this population, uh, which were the Nippon Bear and YK-17. We knock out that gene through the CRISPR-Cas9 technology by using the uh, Picambia 1300 vector and we knock out uh, the vexigen from these two backgrounds and we then later on we find out that the knockout leads toward the glutinaceous rice which was published in another uh, th that study was published uh, later on so now i will talk about the uh, the second portion of uh, my presentation which is uh, uh, genome editing that in this a slide you can you can see that uh, the genome editing was actually started in 18 later work was founded founded in 1885 the, when the radiation were discovered and later on they were used for the development of the mutation breeding and then now at this time in 2020 we are uh, much advanced and now we are using the prime editing technologies and that prime editing technology has been successfully applied in, in rice, wheat and uh, around in, in this year 2021 it is also reported in the tomato as well. So uh, the journey which was started from 1885 and, and nowadays in 2021 that technology has been advanced that we have more precision, we have more efficiency and uh, we have more leverage to, um, to understand the genomic architecture of the traits uh, which are beneficial for human beings. So, on the on the basis of uh, um, on the basis of our previous finding, uh, we try to uh, because many researchers they have done work to uh, knock out the vexi gene. So we did not knock out that gene. That that gene was knocked out in only in the parents of this population just to check if the vexi gene is responsible for that variation or not. But our main consideration remain in the next experiment was related to the gluten and protein. And we use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology because that technology and has been reported successfully in many cereals and model and non-model species. So why we use the genome editing technology? Because uh, genome editing technology have the many uh, positive ad advantages over the traditional genome editing or the old mutation breeding techniques. Like in this slide, you can see that, for instance, we have a plant, we have a rice plant that, that can have ability to tolerate the biotic stress, abiotic stress and have high yielding and have the genes which are associated with the quality, but that plant is not high in quality. We want to fix this problem in this plant. So we have the different options. 
either we go toward the classical breathing techniques that will take a lot of time and energy, but we have no assurity that that our experiment will be successful or at the end we will get some plants or some variety or some lines which have the high quality. But on the other hand, we have, we can consume the less time, but in that case also we have the less efficiency and less precision. That is called the, uh, uh, that is called the mutation breeding. Nowadays, in, in our one of the uh, review article uh, that we have published recently with uh, Professor Freddy, is, um, uh, I worked with, with him and uh, uh, also, uh, Dr. Sunny Ahmer, we we have given a uh, we have given some information that now genome editing technologies are divided into three generations: the first generation, second, and the third generation. And now we have the pro, uh, prime editing uh, prime editing technologies, which is the third generation or the most advanced generation. So, in a one in in a single time, we can knock out many genes altogether, and we have more precision and more the efficiency. Uh, if we talk about the mutation breeding in the mutation breeding, the, the problem is that there are chances to get the success, but the problem is that we have to screen a large number of the mutant population and we need more labor. We need the cost is too high. And, and again, uh, we, we did not know that in which part of the genome the mutation has been happened. So definitely we need a large number of population to screen and to get the mutant plant uh, as per our objective. On the other hand, we have the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, then the CPF1, the CRISPR-12, that is the advanced form of the Cas9. Then we have the base editing, and now we have the primary editing technology in which we can not only uh, knock out one gene, but at the same time, we can knock in uh, the genes and through target several genes altogether, or even uh, several targets within a single gene. So in this way, we have more efficiency, we have more precision, we have ability to knock out or we can have the ability to fix the several genes altogether for a single trait or for the different traits. Like if we want to have a plant which have high quality also have high yield also have the abiotic stress resistance so we can we can uh, identify the different genes controlling these traits and we can fix these, the, these genes or knock out these genes altogether through uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So there are the different advantages and disadvantages of, of these techniques and ultimate our objective is through all these techniques that we have to get the high quality uh, uh, high quality rice as the our objective of this uh, breeding program was to get the high quality rice so in this technique in this method uh, we can have the ability to get the nutritional uh, high nutrition rice with good cooking and eating quality and with a good grain appearance so uh, in, in in this uh, experiment, we actually tried to uh, knock out uh, the uh, glutenin related gene. That gene was uh, the, that gene was only the identified gene that was not um, reported anywhere, or that was uh, just given on the uh, genomic for the glutenin protein. So we given the, that gene a name of glutenin A. And uh, we get some information from the Rice Genome Annotation Project. From there, we get some information, and we selected two targets in the in the exonic re in the same exon of that gene. So, actually, what we done that we use the uh, PC1300 Cas9 uh, vector, and we construct the vector, and then after constructing vector, we uh, then go on with the transformation. And when we're done with the transformation. After that, we screen the mutant. We find out that there are, we have the 100 or 200 mutant plants from the mutant plants. When we're done with the Sanger sequencing, we, feel, we find out that some of the mutant plants, they were homozygous and some of the mutant plants, they were heterozygous. So we consider only the homozygous plants because the homozygous plants, when we grow in the next generation, they have no ability to segregate. But in case of the heterozygous plant, yes, we keep the heterozygous plant, but we uh, later on in the subsequent generation, like in the T2 or T3 generation, we find out that in the heterozygous plant, there, there was a segregation. So in the segregated population, we again find some homozygous plants. So we get several seeds which were good enough for us to conduct the grain quality related uh, experiment. So what we've done, we uh, taken two target uh, and we given name the target one and target two. And uh, each target have around the 20 nucleotides. And at the end of the 20 nucleotide, there was a palm sequence because palm sequence is very important 
for any target uh, region because the guide RNA and the palm sequence they have to unite with each other and on the basis of the palm sequence that then the next uh, process of genome editing that took place. We uh, we find out several homozygous plant and in in the several homozygous plant we find that there were different types of mutation for the both targets. So on on the basis of this mutation we 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 uh, get the seed and we grow the next population. In the next population, when we have the enough number of seeds, we go for the different agronomic and physio, uh, uh, for the different gene quality related analysis. So here you can see that uh, in the in the wild type and the mutant plants, we compare these two plants in, in their spike as well than the plant length, uh, plant height, and also the seed morphological traits we also taken and agronomic data we also uh, taken. And when we analyze the agronomic data, we find out that all the other traits like the plant height and uh, number of pillars and uh, panicle length, and these all agronomic traits that they were similar to the wild type, but only there was a difference of only 1000 grain weight. So uh, uh, might be, we consider might be that is due to uh, the the, uh, the 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 mutant plant may 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 have some that is due to some mutation. So we go on for the uh, electron microscopy of the mutant seed and as well as the wild type seed. So we find out that not only the protein related contents but also the starch granules they were also um, in the mutant plant they were not compact they were they were uh, they, they, they were in the round shape and they were. Uh, uh, they were they were sorted out from each other, but in case of the wild type, they were compact, and uh, maybe that was also a reason that this gene may have the influence on the starch related uh, uh, starch related properties as well. So then we move toward to uh, uh, collect some data uh, uh, for the grain quality related traits that was related to the protein contents, glutamine contents, because these four fractions of protein and the protein content were the main consideration because that was related to the glutamine. So if the mutation was really responsible for, for change, in the, uh, change in the protein content, it must have highly significant difference with the wild type. So we find out that uh, the glutenin content were not only uh, highly significantly different from the wild type, de they decrease, but also the protein content, they were also decreased. But on the other hand, the small fractions of the protein, like the, uh, uh, like the globulin protein, albumin protein, and the prolamin protein, their contents were increased. Might be due to the decrease in the glutenin content, other protein contents were increased. So then we check some other starch related properties like the total starch content, then amylose content, then that in case of gelatinization temperature and total sugar content, there was no difference between the both wild type and mutant, but the, uh, the wild type and mutant, they were highly significantly different from each other on the, uh, for the uh, total starch content and amylose content. The difference between the total starch content might be uh, uh, might be the prediction that this gene is controlling the uh, starch related properties and as well as the protein related properties and it was also seen when we're done with the scanning electron microscopy. So then we moved toward and we uh, collected the different parts of the uh, mutant plants and also the wild type plant and we uh, we considered because this gene was expressing in the highest uh, high expression was there in the 10 days after flowering so we, uh, we, uh, we collected the organs and part of the, uh, of the mutant plants and the wild type and we uh, extracted uh, the RNA and then we prepared the cDNA and we done with the expression Nelson and we find out that the, uh, there was a, a highly significant difference between the wild type and mutant at the different days after flowering, like the five day after flowering, 10 days after flowering, 15 and 20 days after flowering. So then, we compare the mutant plants uh, 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 with the wild type plant for the uh, different other genes which were controlling the similar like the pro, uh, protein contents or glutamine contents related property and we've done the differential transcript expression of the gene which was uh, involved in the glutamine biosynthesis and we find out that uh, the wild type the expression of those genes was high but in case of the mutant plant the expression of those uh, genes was uh, in in those parts at uh, different uh, days after flowering, that was highly significantly lower. So on the basis of this one, we, we uh, predicted that uh, this gene is responsible for controlling the glutenin contents 
and uh, maybe this gene can be further uh, utilized for the plant breeding program. So far, uh, uh, we only study this one gene. So far, there are many other genes which have been identified for the uh, four different types of the quality for the nutrition quality, for the appearance quality, and for the cooking and eating quality. And uh -huh. there is a much possibility that uh, we can use a genome editing technology to unearth the genetic uh, mechanism behind these genes and how these genes are controlling these different traits and how can we exploit these genes. We can develop some mutant plants and uh, through the um, uh, these CRISPR-Cas9 technology, we can with more efficiency and more precision, we can develop some, um, we can develop them, uh, the genotypes are the germ plants which have more better nutrition quality. So we have uh, the possibility that uh, uh, these genes can be utilized uh, further in the next, uh, in the future breeding program. So on the basis of genome editing, we can, uh, we can, we can assume that uh, there are the different future prospects like the, we can have uh, advantage that in future the the genome editing uh, plants cannot be treated as the GMOs because uh, in the different countries around the world the GMOs are strictly banned. So uh, if there will they will be transgene free. So there are possibilities that uh, the genome added crops or genome added plants can be treated as the non-GMOs. Then uh, the genome editing technology will be treated similar as the classical breeding approach because the no foreign gene. Uh, exo, exo, uh, no exogene has been involved, but all the endogenous uh, genome editing will be taken place and no foreign element will be uh, inserted into the plant. Then we, uh, we have ability that uh, we can get the transgene free breeding that the plants may, may have the DNA free delivery. Then there will be less chances of off target effects. It remain uh, a point of discussion among the different researchers that uh, genome editing technology like uh, uh, ZFN, Talens, and RNAi, uh, they, they, they have uh, they have off target effects. Like not only they, they can bring mutation into the targeted region, but also they can, they can create mutation in the off target region, which have some sort of similarity about 50%, 60 or 70%. If the similarity is uh, at this level, they can also create some mutation in the other part as well. So in the uh, in the primary editing technology and the base editing technology, uh, this problem has been greatly reduced. So um, we have now online tools. We have uh, uh, vectors which have the better efficiency. We have the more trained uh, manpower which can, which can handle these uh, genome editing technology with the more efficiency and more precision. So we have chances that we will get in future the off target zero off target effects. Then there there is also possibility. And uh, uh, people are, uh, researchers are also working on that to combine or integrate the genome editing technologies with the uh, novel plant breeding techniques like the speed breeding, omics, and there are other uh, uh, like the developments taking place also in the genome editing, like the prime editing and base editing. And within the prime editing, there are the three generation like the PE1, PE2, and PE3. So PE3 is now the uh, most advanced. Uh, a method which which is uh, used uh, by the researcher and which we, we are using to generate the germ plant and also we have the ability to develop some uh, develop some hybrids as well like, like in rice uh, we have developed the thermogenic maize sterile line which was further utilized uh, in, in, which was further utilized for the hybrid seed production and we successfully taken this like uh, the the mutant plant that was fertile on 22 degree but that was the uh, partial fertile at 24 degree but that was completely sterile at the 26 degree so similarly we not only have the genes identified gene for related to the thermogenic but also we have the photoperiod sensitive genes as well so we have uh, uh, we have the golden opportunity to grab these novel plant breeding techniques and the genome editing technologies we just need uh, the funding we need resources and definitely we need technologies for the betterment of the human beings. So in the last uh, here, I would like to present some of my selected publication, which we have made related to the grain quality. So you know, like the both of uh, my first experiment, now they are published on, they are available online. I will also share with the uh, professor Carlos. So he will share with the, all of you 
and also we have uh, 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 we have like uh, some have uh, made some publication which are related to the apomixis apomixis is actually that we have tried to uh, give an idea uh, that how can the genome editing technology can preserve the hybrid vigor so farmer did not need to buy the f1 seed every year so if we will be successful right now there, there is only 30% uh vigor intact seed in the f2 population through the through the apomix induction of the apomixes but that is below the economic value so we are hopeful that as the information will be gathered and we have more information later to the genes which are controlling the apomixes phenomena asexual propagation we can have better chance that we can develop some uh, develop a jump plant which have more ability to preserve the hybrid vigor as well so uh thank uh, lastly, I would like to say thank to the different funding agencies which uh, has helped us during uh, the experimentation and conducting these experiments. Uh, firstly, the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan, then I am thankful to China for providing us the funding and space and uh, to conduct these experiments. Uh, and also, I am uh, thankful to all of you to hearing my uh, presentation with patience. I am sorry because there was some problem. I was unable to um, uh, turn on my video. So please uh, accept my apology for this one. So now I, over to Professor Carlos. So if there are some uh, questions, so we can respond accordingly. Thank you.